the Max Headroom incident. In the evening of November 7, two separate television channels were hijacked in the city of Chicago, Illinois. What makes this one stand out among others would be the fact that whoever did this was dressed as Max Headroom, an AI character popular at the time. The first incident took place for 25 seconds during the sports cast on WGN TV. The second occurred for 90 seconds during a PBS broadcast of Doctor Who. The first interruption just involved the man moving in a similar way to Max until it cut out. The sports anchor Dan Rowan amused that, well if you're wondering what's happened, so am I. The second interruption was similar, but also involved the man making comments on sports pundit Chuck Swirsky. He also takes out a bottle of Pepsi and says, catch the wave, which is the slogan of New Coke. He eventually begins to expose himself before getting hit by a fly swatter from someone off camera. Now what's really strange about this is that whoever did this was never caught. Lebanon War Broadcast Intrusion On the morning of July 12, 2006, a group of Hezbollah fighters from Lebanon fired rockets at the Israel border. This would lead to a 34-day conflict which would end the lives of over 1,000 Lebanese people, most being civilians. During the time of this conflict, Israel hijacked a Hezbollah program, al Manar TV, in order to leave a chilling message. This involved showing graphic war-related videos and images. Most important of all was a picture of Hassan Nasrallah, the Hezbollah leader being covered by crosshairs with the sound of three gunshots. A voice will then be heard saying, Your day is coming. It ends with even more wartime footage. UBV-76 radio station. This strange station has been transmitting non-stop since the late 1970s, but the earliest known recording is from 1982. It was first traced to Parvaro, Russia during the Cold War. It makes this really annoying buzzing sound that has been going non-stop since it began. This has given it the nicknames of the buzzer and the hummer. The buzzer has only stopped a couple of times the first being on Christmas Eve of 1997. A Russian man's voice came on to read a list of names and numbers. Since the new millennium, these have become more frequent. Since then, the signal is coming from Piskov, Russia. It is still unknown what this radio station is for, but some believe it is a way to communicate with spies without the message being tracked. Lee Harvey Oswald's assassination. On November 22, 1963, 35th President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, was fatally shot outside the streets of downtown Dallas, Texas. Less than an hour after, Lee Harvey Oswald killed a police officer who questioned him on the street. He was brought in to the police shortly after the two alleged murders. On November 24, Oswald was brought to the basement of the Dallas Police Headquarters on his way to a more secure jail. A crowd of police and press with live television cameras rolling gathered to witness his departure. Then, out of nowhere, came Jack Ruby, a local nightclub owner. He shot Oswald, killing him. Police immediately detained him. Some called him a hero, but he was still arrested. Zombie Emergency Alert On February the 11th, 2013, 
Residents of Montana were startled by fake alerts of dead bodies rising from their graves. These messages mainly appeared on WBUP-TV and WNMU-TV. This would later occur in the states of New Mexico and Michigan as well. It was reported that the hacker was able to send the emergency messages via a back door of the system's security. Eventually, the hacker was found and arrested. Civil authorities in your area have reported that the bodies of the dead are rising from their graves and attacking the living. Follow the messages on screen that will be updated as information becomes available. Do not attempt to approach or apprehend these bodies as they are considered extremely dangerous. Joseph Burr's death. On Halloween night of 1990, this self-proclaimed Harry Houdini decided that for his next trick, he would bury himself alive at a local amusement park. Hundreds of people were watching, including his two kids. On that night, Burris was chained and handcuffed and laid in a plastic glass coffin. He was lowered into a seven-foot grave and then covered in tons of dirt. The act was filmed and projected onto a large video screen, and it was even broadcasted on live radio. The crowd watched as the grave was eventually filled with wet concrete. However, things went wrong when the grave fell by two feet. The coffin had collapsed and Burris was choking. By the time he was dug out, he had died of asphyxia. Joe never calculated the strength of the box, nor the weight of the concrete. The Captain Killdozer Incident this topic has been well discussed on this channel before, but it definitely deserved a place on this list. To summarize it, Marvin Heemeyer was a hardware store owner from Grandy, Colorado, who was pissed off at the city for many different zoning disputes. So in order to get back at everyone he claims wronged him, he modifies his bulldozer with armor and gun holders. He rampages the town, destroying 13 buildings and many other obstacles. Eventually, Hemeyer runs out of gas and gets stuck in the basement of a rival shop. So he takes out one of his guns and ends his life. Much of this event was broadcasted on live TV for all to see. show you how far he gets and then we'll take it up to where we actually have members of the uh, Grand County SWAT team, the Sheriff's Office SWAT team, standing on top of the Caterpillar trying to figure out how to get in. I'm sure police officers, sheriff's deputies were themselves assuming for a time that he was armed because they were trying to keep their distance, trying to take cover, actually took cover as you can see there behind the scraper, but they seemed to realize at some point that he was unable to shoot out and that at this point he was like... Inajiro Asanuma's assassination. On October 12, 1960, a political debate was held in the Hibiya Hall in Tokyo. Asanuma was giving his lecture in front of 1,000 people, while also being televised live. Suddenly, a 17-year-old boy rushed on stage and stabbed the politician with a traditional samurai sword. Asanuma was stabbed in the stomach, but before he could be stabbed again, the boy was tackled. However, the stab was enough to end his life. The boy was Otomiya Yamaguchi, who was very unhappy with Asanuma's political views. Still wearing his school uniform, he was hauled away by police. In prison, Yamaguchi would eventually commit suicide using bedsheets of all things. Coast to Coast AM Area 51 Call On September the 11th, 1997, a man claiming to be working for the elusive Area 51 called into this radio station. Host of the Coast to Coast show, Art Bell, questions a frantically talking man for his reason to call. The man explains that he doesn't have a whole lot of time before delving into descriptions of extra-dimensional beings and plots by the government. Not too long after, the transition to the station is lost, leaving Art Bell and the rest of the crew confused. On April the 28th, 1998, 
Art received another call, supposedly by the same man. He claims that the initial call was a hoax. This can really make you think, was this all fake? Or could this be the government trying to cover up something a rogue worker came out about? Of, of, of the military establishment, particularly the Area 51. Uh, the, the disasters that are coming, they, the, the military, I'm sorry, the, the government knows about them. And there's a lot of safe areas in this world that they could begin moving the population to now, Art. But they're not doing, they're not doing anything. They are not, they want the major population centers wiped out so that the, the few that are left will be more easily controllable. Discharge. <laughs> Verlon Southern Broadcast Interruption The Southern Television Station, located in the UK, is mainly known for one of the most mysterious signal interruptions ever. It occurred at 5.10pm on November 26, 1977. TV news anchor Andrew Gardner was reading the day's headlines before his voice was cut out and replaced with a distorted voice. This voice claimed to be an alien named Verlon who was representing a body called the Ashtar Galactic Command. After the intrusion ended, the station began playing a Looney Tunes cartoon. The whole thing mostly only affected the audio, with the normal broadcast just being somewhat distorted. Many claim it was to be a hoax, but after 40 years, we still don't know if it was fake or indeed it was aliens planning on world domination. Daniel V. Jones Truck Fire By the end of April of 1998, Jones believed he was going to die from HIV. So, he decided to end his life, which would occur in a bizarre, strange way. On April 30th, Jones parked his pickup truck on the transition loop of the Century Freeway in Los Angeles. With his dog Gladys by his side, he called 911. During this call, he revealed why he was so emotionally distraught, while at the same time shooting rounds from his shotgun. Police and news helicopters circled around him as he threw items over the freeway wall. Jones then took out a banner he had made and displayed it for the helicopters to see. He then got back in his truck to ignite a Molotov cocktail. The vehicle burst into flames as he then attempted to jump off the rails. Instead, he backed up, took out his shotgun, put it under his chin, and opened fired. As this was a Thursday afternoon, the entire mess was seen by many children whose after-school cartoons had been interrupted. The Japanese Tsunami On March 11, 2011, one of the most deadly natural disasters occurred. A magnitude 9 earthquake unleashed a large tsunami, which killed about 230,000 people. This footage shows its effects on the Sendai region in northern Hanashu Island. CCTV footage from across Japan show even more footage relating to the carnage this created. This became one of the biggest news stories of the year, and many rushed to help. Even to this day, many natives to this area still need a place to live. Oh, 
何これ何これさっきの人はさっきの人はマニラ tour bus hostage crisis On August the 23rd 2010 Former police officer Rolando Mendoza hijacked a Philippine tourist bus. Inside the bus were 25 hostages, 20 of whom being tourists from Hong Kong. Mendoza claimed that he was unfairly fired from his job and demanded a fair hearing. Police surrounded the bus, trying to make negotiations at around 7:20 p.m. that day, until Mendoza saw his brother get arrested on live television. This made him even angrier, so he fired off some warning shots. While Mendoza demanded his brother to be released, the bus driver managed to escape. The driver falsely informed them that the hostages were dead, so police stormed the bus. A 90-minute gun battle ensued, which resulted in the deaths of Mendoza and eight hostages. Nine more were injured. Of course, this was witnessed like by those in the Philippines and Hong Kong. Controversy arises soon after over what police could have done better, but just remember. This whole thing could have ended even worse if they hadn't entered the bus sooner. Gary Stolman, KNBC incident. It was a regular Wednesday broadcast for KNBC. Reporter David Horowitz was reading out the news before a man appeared behind with what seemed to be a gun. This man was Gary Stolman, whose father has worked there. Stolman decided that Horowitz read a rambling statement on air about aliens and the CIA. Luckily, the station went off the air before he would do so. Also. The gun turned out to be a toy, so Stolman was taken into custody. This all occurred on August 20th, 1987. Stolman is obviously not sane, proven by the beginning of his written statement. It reads, "The man who has appeared on KNBC for the past three years is not my biological father. He is a clone, a double created by the Central Intelligence Agency and alien forces. It is only a small part of a greater plot." To overthrow the United States government and possibly the human race itself. The LA riots. This major outbreak of violence all began on April 29, 1992. The previous year, four police officers severely beat an African American motorist named Rodney King. All four were acquitted. With many in the community not liking this, protests soon turned to riots. Over 50 people were killed, and 2,300 were injured. Thousands were arrested, and billions of dollars worth of damage was caused. News stations across the world broadcasted live these terrifying five-day events. While this happened, many outside the town supported the carnage, while others condemned this. This all ended when troops were sent into the city. If not for that, this could have all ended much later on, after too much destruction had been caused. KCR hijacking. In March of 2013, an anonymous 4chan user posted about the hijacking of Columbia University's 89.9 radio station. This post reads, "Back in 1994 or 1995, when I was recorded this off of my radio, I told myself I would never make a copy of the tape, having freaked myself out. But it's been sitting in the back of my desk drawer in the back of my mind for 16 years now, and now I'm just curious. The weird stuff starts at about 16 seconds in." Around 1995, I was 15. I used to stay up late in my room listening to radio on a boombox with an integrated tape recorder. 
I dial for the station so when I heard something interesting, I'd hit record for a while and then move on. One night, I came across this. I don't think this is the beginning of the broadcast, but I cut a lot of it. Right at the end, an announcer says that the station I was tuned into is WKCR 89.9 New York. There's a bunch of names and dates in there, but it never runs to anything else like this. The hijacking makes some very odd noises, with what seems to be cheerful screaming. A few minutes in, a voice begins reading lines of what appears to be obituaries, including the name of Robert Oppenheimer, the man is considered to have made the atomic bomb. Many others witness this hijacking, ruining the theory that this is being a number station, but after a quarter of a century, this has still never been solved. Bud Dwyer's Final Moments After he bagged a second term as the Pennsylvania State Treasurer, Bud was accused alongside Dick Thornborough for taking bribes. He was said to have pocketed a $300,000 bribe to influence the award of the contract in favour of CTA. Four witnesses testified that he indeed did this. Amid the trials, Bud kept pleading that he was innocent, but was sentenced to be held in prison for 55 years, along with a fine. The hearing for his sentence was to be held on January the 23rd, 1987. But a day before, he held a press conference to further plead his innocence. Then, Bud pulled out a manila envelope in which he took out a revolver. News coverage of the event continued to film as Bud pointed the gun under his chin and opened fire. And it turned out that Bud Dwyer was innocent the entire time. He never did take any bribes. He was an honest man. Okay, just hang on to that right for the moment. Don, there's some things for you to do and it's an order here for Joanne. Challenger Space Shuttle Explodes On January 28, 1986, shortly after it launched, the Challenger external fuel tank had collapsed, releasing all of its liquid nitrogen and liquid oxygen propellants. As the chemicals mixed, they ignited and created a giant fireball. This broke off the tanks and wings, causing the shuttle to break apart into the water. All seven astronauts on the ship passed away as this happened. Even though few actually witnessed it on TV, it is still known as a deadly disaster which changed space exploration forever. Now on the way, after more delays than NASA cares to count, this morning it looked as though they were not going to be able to get off. 15 seconds, velocity 2900 feet per second, altitude 9 nautical miles, down range distance 7 nautical miles. Christine Chubbuck's on-air suicide. 29-year-old Christine worked as a news reporter on Channel 40, the local Florida TV station. Her colleagues have said that she was very high-spirited, which wasn't really true. She struggled with depression and suicidal tendencies, which her family knew about. A couple weeks before her death, she told Mike Simmons she wanted to do a news piece about suicide. She visited the local sheriff's department to talk to an officer about the most effective suit methods of suicide. She was told the best way to do so would be a pistol to the head. She later told Rob Smith, the news editor, that she had bought a gun. She joked about killing herself on air, saying, Well, I thought it would be a nifty idea if I went on the air live and just blew myself away. On the morning of July 15, 1974, she did just that. A malfunction occurred on set, 
So Christine, live on air, said, In keeping with Channel 40's policy of bringing you the latest in blood and guts, and in living color, you are going to see another first attempted suicide. She then drew a revolver from under her desk and shot herself from behind her right ear. The recording has since been hidden away by authorities and her family, only to be remembered by those who saw it. A couple of days before the incident, Christine hosted a going away party, making you think about how well she planned this out. The 9-11 Tragedy on September 11, 2001, at 8.45 a.m., an American Airlines Boeing loaded with 200,000 gallons of jet fuel crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York City. This left a gaping hole on the 80th floor, which instantly killed hundreds, left those in the upper floors trapped and made the rest of them try to escape and evacuate. Not too long after, a second Boeing plane struck the South Tower in its 60th floor. The Pentagon was also attacked shortly after leaving many dead there too. The Twin Towers would eventually collapse, turning the World Trade Center into a massive cloud of smoke and dust. Another plane was going to hit, but the passengers were able to stop this. Overall, about 3,000 people died from the terrorist attack. The whole thing was broadcasted for everyone to see, and the world would never be the same. NYW here, live coverage here of this amazing picture we're getting from Lower Manhattan. Two planes, one hitting each of the Twin Towers at the World Trade Center. As they come by and they say, what happened, what happened? And you just got to say, something hit the building, and then something hit both buildings. Well, we, uh, we, we saw clearly, uh, we didn't see the first one, but we saw clearly that a plane... Uh, deliberately crashed into the one of the upper floors of the World Trade Center. That was the second plane. So two planes uh, crashed into the uh, upper floors of each of the World Trade Center towers. And I'm just, uh, I understand now that the uh, Port Authority headquarters are in uh, one of those buildings somewhere near that location. 